cryptocurrency's money. To chase these kids around in an armored Humvee with a 50 cal is like chasing me around with a, with a uh, ISIS flag. Sometimes they feel like we're not treated fairly, but you know, we're not employees. At a cabinet meeting today, a reporter asked President Trump if Russia was still targeting American elections. Is Russia still targeting the U.S., Mr. President? Thank Press, you let's much. go. Make your way out. No, we don't want that to be the case. Let's go. We're finished here. The White House said this afternoon that Trump's no was actually the president declining to answer questions. The president said after the question was asked was, thank you very much. And then he said, no, I'm not answering any more questions. The European Union has fined Google a record $5 billion, what Google earns in just two weeks, for breaching EU antitrust rules by forcing the manufacturers that use its Android operating system to pre-install Google's search engine and apps. These practices, they have denied rivals a chance to innovate and to compete on the merits. Starting August 1st, the private defense firm that made the first 3D printed gun will put its firearm blueprints back online. Defense Distributed settled with the State Department after arguing that publishing the files was exercising free speech. I said, I wonder if we should use the same baby blue color, and we're not. You know what colors we're using? Take a guess. Red, white, and blue. Red, white, and blue. Air Force One is going to be Incredible. It's going to be the top of the line, the top in the world, and it's going to be red, white, and blue, which I think is appropriate. Today, the House Agriculture Committee held a hearing about cryptocurrencies. Why the Agriculture Committee? It oversees the trading of commodities, which in the past only meant agricultural and mining products, like pork bellies, gold, soybeans, and fuel. But these days, some people argue that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies should count too. They may not be physical products, but like other commodities, they have value and are traded back and forth. Someday soon, the committee members may figure out whether that makes sense. But today, they're just trying to understand what cryptocurrencies actually are. Mike Cottaway. Nice to see you, Mr. Chairman. Come on in, please. Thank have a seat. What, what are you hoping to get at up today? Uh, I hope just an educational just process. Education. Okay, um, okay. The overarching question would be securities, commodities, of where's course. the line? Of course. And, and the other idea is that, you know, if we don't have to regulate something, we really shouldn't. But if we do, then it ought to be regulated smartly yep. and, uh, and by the right regulator. Chairman Michael Conway knows his committee could end up having to regulate Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, which is why he organized a hearing. What has it been like learning about cryptocurrencies? So I read the paper, the white paper from Sakamoto, whatever the guy's name, from 2008. I can define the words that were used. I can't define them placed in the sentences that he put them in. So it's a, it's a steep learning curve. How well would you say that your colleagues understand cryptocurrencies? There are 46 of us on the committee, and uh, there'll be 46 different levels of understanding. How do you prepare for a hearing like this? Uh, read a lot. Bitcoin launched in 2009, and today, there are more than 1,600 different cryptocurrencies. There are more than 200 exchanges on which you can buy digital coins, and the value of all cryptocurrency right now is almost $300 billion. Congress actually held its first hearing on Bitcoin back in 2013. Fundamental questions remain about what a virtual currency actually is. But most members still have a lot of catching up to do. I don't know where to start. Um... <clears throat> You know, I'm somebody that believes we should still be on the gold standard. I'm a flip phone guy in a uh, Bitcoin world anyhow, so I'll just, you know, no pretense here. We are a long way from the peanut fields in Sycamore, Georgia. In April, Congress was not ready for a high-stakes public reckoning with Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg. So if you don't, you're not listening to us on the phone, who is... Given how fast cryptocurrencies are growing, representatives could be headed toward a similar failure if they don't get up to speed soon. How should regulators think about the function of the token when choosing to apply regulatory requirements? The underlying token itself should be regulated as if it were a commodity. It's going to be a security depending on its characteristics. Do you see this insinuating itself into the broader economy? 
we believe that this really uh, is going to create a whole new set of, uh, of infrastructure on which all kinds of new applications are built, some which we may, we may not even know about today. 4% of the addresses hold 97% of the Bitcoin in the world. Uh, is this concerning to you, and, and what should lawmakers be doing? Well, it's one of the natural ironies because we all, humans, tend towards clusters and clumps and centralization. There was also another hearing about cryptocurrencies today. I think if, if you look at why the... Are cryptocurrencies money? Congress, in other words, is working on multiple fronts to figure out what cryptocurrencies are and what to do about them. It's not clear that much progress has been made. But for Conway, just getting his colleagues together to talk about these things was at least a step in the right direction. I thought it would be great. Just scratch the surface, quite frankly, on uh, where we need to go. But uh, I was really pleased with the hearing. How far do you feel that the members are from being able to actually craft some sort of regulatory? Long way. Like just, long way. A long way? Yeah. Today, a D.C. magistrate judge ruled that Maria Butina, the Russian national charged with conspiracy to act as an agent of the Russian government, will remain in custody for now. Prosecutors allege that the 29-year-old tried to cultivate relationships with Republican operatives and the Trump campaign. Her social media accounts show her posing with prominent conservatives. Her lawyer said she was just networking, but the court documents in Butina's case outline what the government says is a broader scheme to gain influence in GOP politics through an unnamed gun rights organization, quote, for the purpose of advancing the agenda of the Russian Federation. Back in January, McClatchy reported that the FBI was investigating whether a Russian with ties to the Kremlin and Butina funneled money through the NRA to help elect Trump. The NRA says that while it does accept foreign money, it doesn't spend that money on election activities. And under certain circumstances, it is entirely legal for foreign governments to make those contributions and for groups like the NRA to put them to use. This Butina case is the stuff of spy novels, but foreign governments seek influence in our politics all the time through more mundane and legal ways. One of the easiest, our campaign finance system. The Federal Election Campaign Act of 1974 prohibits foreign entities from directly or indirectly making any kind of contribution in connection with an election. But the Supreme Court's 2010 Citizens United decision allowed corporations to make unlimited contributions to two kinds of politically active groups, super PACs and 501c4s. So there's not much keeping American corporations owned by foreigners from contributing to political groups. In fact, in 2015, Jeb Bush actually benefited from a 1.3 million donation made to a super PAC by American Pacific International Capital Incorporated. The Intercept traced that corporation back to a Chinese couple who lived in Singapore at the time. That was only made public because super PACs are required to disclose their donors publicly. 501c4s like the NRA are not. Up until this tax year, they were at least supposed to give the IRS donors names and addresses, though that information wasn't made public. But the Treasury Department announced Monday that it wouldn't collect that information anymore, making it even less likely that any sort of fishy corporation's contribution would raise any red flags. And that's another way foreign entities can contribute, by creating shell corporations to mask where the money is coming from. I spoke to Robert McGuire, a political nonprofit investigator at the Center for Responsive Politics. He said that even with all the donor records available, it's highly unlikely any groups would be held accountable for using foreign contributions on political campaigns. The lack of enforcement happens at every single level. The FEC, which has three Republican commissioners and three Democratic commissioners, deadlocks on every single decision of import. The IRS only audits seven out of every 1,000 annual tax returns that come by. And then you have Congress, which hasn't been able to do anything to add clarity to the rules or to stem the amount of dark money flowing into elections. So really, anywhere you look, 
things are getting easier for people who want to spend money in elections without having their fingerprints on it. It's not actually illegal for foreign governments to contribute to 501c4s. It's just illegal for the 501c4s to use that foreign money on political activity. The NRA has said that in 2015 and in 2016, they didn't receive Russian money. But in theory, they could receive Russian money and say they used it for operational expenses, like pens and printer paper. That would be totally kosher under the law. Parkland school shooting survivors are traveling around the country this summer on a 20-state bus tour to call attention to gun violence and demand gun control legislation. And they're now being tailed by some unlikely and unwanted groupies, gun rights activists, following them from stop to stop and holding protests of their own. You talking exchange staff, let's bring it in. You know, I think I'm, I'm certain if we are just ourselves and we act as we normally do, there will be a lot of good information to come out. One, two, three, freedom! I honestly do not hate the March for Our Live folks. In fact, I love them. They're kids to the degree that the kids are actually talking. I may be the gun lobbyist, but you're the gun lobby. And thank you. Thank you very much. It's a weird dynamic because it's the super like liberal people of Salt Lake and then the outskirts of yeah, Salt, Salt Lake, Salt Lake. <laughs> coming in all in one room. Exactly. We are now going to leave and head over to the convention center where the March for Our Lives rally is going to be held and we're going to assemble peacefully outside. My gun sits right here on my side and doesn't jump out and shoot anybody. So stop telling me it's the gun. Do you believe in bump stocks? That's a machine gun. She bought me one for Father's Day. I, I'm hey, sorry. If you want more gun control, move to Australia. If you guys want more gun control, move to Australia. Utah gun exchange is tastefully omitted. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I was hiding in my classroom for three hours, um, not knowing what was going on, hearing helicopters, sirens, wailing. Spent that night crying my eyes out, not knowing who was dead. This is like an hour, and then the last 30 is audience question. I didn't really know what to do with myself, so I immediately started organizing. I see a lot of pain in every room that we go to, but I also see a lot of joy and I see a lot of hope. People actually enjoy us coming because they feel like they have someone to talk to. Hello, Salt Lake City! A lot of people have claimed that we have a distaste for our Constitution and for our Bill of Rights, which is just simply not the case. We, we are strong supporters of the Constitution. We are strong supporters of our Second Amendment. But we also realize where we need to make sure that the public are safe. In the spirit of dialogue, we will be opening with a question from Sam Robinson, co-owner of the Utah Gun Exchange. So my question is to the panel and to March for Our Lives, the official organization, are you willing to work officially with Second Amendment organizations to see what common ground we can find in order to work together to create safer schools and communities outside of gun control? There are various violence interrupters all across the country that we have been supporting. Alex King can speak for himself. Yes, like we have also have organizations in Chicago where we go through our communities and not only through our communities now, but trying to take it to the national level where we teach the uh, philosophy of Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, teaching the way of nonviolence throughout um, not only the city of Chicago, but further. The thing, I've, I have a problem with the, uh, the with youth is they don't know how the world works. And uh... Let him finish. Let him finish. How do you propose to get the guns from the Bloods and the Crips before you're, you ask the law-abiding citizens such as myself to give up their guns? I'd like to first clarify, as no one has asked any law-abiding citizens to give up their guns, yeah. especially from the March for Our Lives. And just for uh, the statement you made earlier about the youth doesn't know how the world works, um, 
we know that lives being taken away on a daily basis by a gun is not right. Why do my friends and I feel afraid of talking about pro-gun views at school? Why do people text me and yell at me, yell at me and my friends when I go shooting at a shooting range? Also, Utah Gun Exchange did a march before our lives, and as we were walking back to our cars, adults and kids at the same time were swearing at us, flipping us off, and coming up to argue with us. I, I will say it was misguided and misinformed hate that might have gone your way. But if one is going to have a counter protest to something that is literally called March for Our Lives, it is not going to look good. And I will not justify hate. I will not justify any of that. I'm not sure whether we bridge any gaps tonight. Uh, we're, we're not. Uh, I thought that the majority of the interactions uh, were very civil. And I think that that is a step in the right direction. When it comes to talking to people that don't agree with us, we want to have more of those conversations. We, we want these people to come inside so we can hear them out and they can hear us out. We are sending a message to the president of Uganda. After massive public pushback, Uganda's parliament will reconsider a tax on social media tomorrow. The leader of these protests is Robert Chagulani, a popular musician who's better known for his stage name, Bobby Wine. Wine was elected to parliament last year, thanks to an anti-establishment campaign that took aim at President Yoweri Museveni. In Uganda, everything has been gagged. Uh, for a radio TV station, if it's not praising the establishment or the regime, then it's going to either be overtaxed or to be closed. So social media is the last avenue for Ugandans to freely express themselves. And that is why the president is moving to block social media. Since July 1st, the social media tax has charged a daily fee of 200 shillings or 5 cents to a user's SIM card to unblock 58 sites from Facebook to WhatsApp. So I want to buy some airtime. It also charges half a percent on money transfers that many people use to pay for school and send money home. So I've just got a text saying I've paid my weekly OTT social media service tax and it cost me 1,400 shillings, which is about 40 cents. That may not sound like a lot of money, but a third of Ugandans live on less than a dollar and 25 cents a day. The idea behind it is to make sure that as a country, we try as much as possible to bridge the deficit. David Bahati is a finance minister and was a key advocate for the tax as a way to generate revenue. He is proudly analog and doesn't use a smartphone or social media. How much money have you raised so far from this tax? We have been able to raise uh, close to 500,000 uh, US dollars, and we do expect to, to raise close to 40 million US dollars in the, in the whole year. Which is actually an encouragement uh, to all of us uh, in terms of uh, being responsible uh, to make a contribution to build more infrastructure, to support innovation. President Museveni may need to pay the tax himself. On Twitter, he likes to update his 858,000 followers with weather reports and dietary advice. But he said in a statement also released on Twitter that chatting on social media isn't a necessity and it's only done by people who are enjoying themselves or those who are malicious. The president hates social media. Why? because Ugandans get the chance to tell him off. Police briefly detained Bobby Wine today for leading the protests. But tomorrow, he'll get his chance to tell the government off when Parliament debates the tax. This is refreshing it. So, but now they've changed it. They're making it harder for people to get blocks. 
you have to accept it, so you have to accept it and swipe it. It's very, very competitive. Beverly Karpinski is 64 years old, and she is one of thousands of independent contractors who deliver packages for Amazon in a program called Flex. A few days a week, she and her husband, Ed, pack up a cooler and drive 45 minutes to an Amazon warehouse. I don't think it's going to rain. It's going to be hotter than 105. Hopefully it will be easier. We'll also be done before it gets 105. I think we should go because there might be a long line today. Do it. Beverly used to get money from the state to care for her mother. That money dried up when her mom moved to a nursing home. Now she makes most of her money from flights. We started a year ago Christmas, and it saved our lives. For three months, we had no income except for my husband's Social Security check. And then one day I was on Craigslist, and I saw that Amazon was hiring independent delivery drivers, and we both signed up for it. Prime Day starts 3 p.m. July This is Amazon's 36-hour version of Black Friday. Millions of items go on sale across the site, and Amazon is deploying flex drivers to get packages delivered quickly. Earlier today, the company said it sold over 100 million products, its biggest Prime Day ever. Amazon declined to provide any specific numbers on how many flex drivers there are, saying it's proprietary information. But Amazon told Vice News it leverages flex in anticipation of Prime Day. It's Amazon's own version of Uber, But instead of taking someone from point A to point B, you take packages from a warehouse and deliver them along a predetermined route. Is this? We are in the line. At 10 10 for 10 15s? Yes, 10 Okay. Amazon's Flex program allows the company to reduce the most expensive part of delivering a package, getting it from the warehouse to the customer's doorstep. Thanks. Bye, thanks. So it tells me that I scanned 42 packages and I've got 34 stops. And then it'll tell me as I'm working, it'll tell me how many I've delivered, any that there's a problem with, and um, how many I have left to do. When Flex launched in late 2015, it created a new segment of Amazon's workforce that the company can manipulate via its own algorithms and application responding to surges in demand without having to pay salaried drivers. At about 500 feet, your destination is on the right. Basically, it says you've arrived. I get out of the car, I find my package. I have to scan those packages, take them to the door. Then I put it there, I take a picture of it, I ring the bell, and I leave. In Arizona, flex drivers make $18 an hour but without any benefit. The $231 Beverly has made in the last four days has to cover things like car maintenance and gas. She'd like to work more, but delivery blocks are too competitive. My husband's out on his route and in a rental car, and now the rental car has broke down. (laughs) This is the kind of stuff we deal with. No coolant. All drained out. The GPS took me down a dirt road for about 10 miles. Potholes and big rocks. Who knows? Yeah, I've only been able to deliver one package on this. I think I had 35 stops. So now I still have all those stops to make. And I'll be on my own time because I'm sitting here waiting for an hour for the tow truck to come. I mean, I would be shocked that if they paid me for this time here. Is this the tow truck already? Wrong car? Yeah, from AAA. You're not it, huh? No. Not him. As a flex driver, there's no boss to complain to. Only an email support line that sends back automated replies. Amazon can cut off your access to the Flex app without warning. I believe this is my last package. Woohoo! <laughs> Yay! We have sort of like this love-hate relationship with Amazon. We like our jobs, and we, you know, we all try to do a good job, but sometimes we feel like we're not treated fairly. But, you know, we're not employees. 
So it says, thank you. Well done. You've completed your current deliveries, earned extra dollars by scheduling more for today. And then it's showing me my next block for tomorrow. 